This is Discovery, a program where you can discover the meaning and the message of the Bible. Hello and welcome to the programme, as we continue the exciting and challenging story of that Old Testament character Daniel. This time we come to chapter 5, but in case you've missed some or all of the previous four talks in this series, here's Derek with a short summary of events so far. Let's hurriedly recap on the story so far. In 605 BC, the Babylonian army rumbled like a juggernaut across the land of Israel, destroying Jerusalem and laying waste villages. Captives were led away in chains, one of whom was young Daniel. They trekked on foot to a strange land. It must have been a massive culture shock. Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, were some of the bright rising stars of Israel, smart and talented. They were brainwashed in the pagan ideas of Babylon, but never embraced them. They remained true to the God of Israel in their hearts. God had a plan for Daniel's life, not a backup plan. He didn't switch from plan A to plan B, because of unexpected circumstances. The Babylonian invasion did not come as a surprise to God. It was part of the plan. Daniel lived in Nebuchadnezzar's palace in luxurious surroundings with all their corrosive values. He and his Hebrew friends challenged the status quo at great personal risk. Whilst the Chaldeans were the so-called spiritual advisers influencing King Nebuchadnezzar, it was Daniel who spoke truth to power as God's man of purpose, prayer and prophecy. Let's turn now to Daniel chapter 5. Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 BC and at least 23 years have elapsed since the events of chapter 4. Now the king in charge of Babylon is Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. He gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and in an act of drunken bravado he ordered the holy gold goblets taken from the sacked Jerusalem temple to be used. In their brazen blasphemy they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. Verse 4. No doubt Belshazzar felt a euphoric sense of invincibility welling up within him. He was the greatest king in the world. No invader had been able to storm the city of Babylon, and the boast was that there was enough food stored away to feed the city's population for twenty years. This self-indulgent monarch was completely indifferent to the danger posed by the Medo-Persian army camped outside the city walls. The dateline was 539 BC. Daniel was now in his 80s. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. Verses 5 and 6. The disembodied fingers wrote cryptic graffiti on the wall, mysterious Aramaic words. The so-called wise men for the third time notch up another epic failure as they are incapable of interpreting the writing on the wall. 
the queen appears and reminds that there is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. Verse 11. He has insight and intelligence and wisdom, a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Verse 12. Some testimony from a pagan queen as she rehearses Daniel's CV. Daniel is summoned. Once he was a young man going into the presence of an old king, Nebuchadnezzar. Now Daniel is an old man standing before young king, Belshazzar. Never underestimate the power of one solitary, godly life. Daniel's integrity, complete confidence in God and the word of God hidden in his heart enable him to speak out God's truth. Daniel tells Belshazzar that despite knowing how arrogance and pride brought down his grandfather, he foolishly pursued a similar course. You have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Indeed, you have set yourself up against the Lord of Heaven. Verses 22 to 23. You did not honour the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Verse 23. The writing on the wall is a symbolic message of doom. Mene, mene, tikel, parsin. Daniel gives the interpretation like a jury foreman announcing the verdict. This is what the words mean. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Belshazzar's response is odd. He doesn't seem to realise that the party's over. He remains unmoved. Perhaps he's too drunk to care. He promoted Daniel and gave him honour. I love Chuck Swindle's comment on this chapter. Taking serious things lightly was Belshazzar's deadly mistake. When the strong winds of war started whipping around the walls of Babylon, instead of boarding up windows and bracing himself, Belshazzar threw a hurricane party. That very night, Belshazzar was slain. According to the Greek historians Herodotus and Xenophon, the combined forces of the Medes and Persians diverted the Euphrates River, causing the water level to drop, enabling them to enter by night through unguarded sluice gates, and the city of Babylon fell without a fight or harm to the capital. The 62-year-old who took over the kingdom was Cyrus's ingenious commander, Gubaru, here called Darius the Mede. Here's the lesson. God will continue to turn over kingdoms until Christ comes. Proverbs 29 verse 1 states, A man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. The Lord is sovereign. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt a man, but it is God who judges. He brings one down, he exalts another. Psalm 75 verses 6 and 7. Next time, in chapter 6, we find Daniel is the subject of a conspiracy to have him killed. We trust that you're finding these studies in Daniel instructive and helpful. Until next time then, this is Keith Stuffins to thank you again for listening and to say goodbye. Goodbye.